Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I wanna thank everyone who's attending today. Before we get started too much, I just wanna let everybody know that we did get quite a few registrants for today's session. So if you know anyone who tries to log in and is not able to, we do wanna let you know that the series planning committee does intend to make these recordings of all of the panel discussions available at a future date. We are pleased to have a wide range of community members and partners with a broad and diverse background present today for this first panel discussion in our series. The series is entitled, as you know, Confronting Racial Injustice, Achieving Racial Equity in Hawaii. It's being presented as a partnership between the Hawaii Judiciary's Committee on Equality and Access to the Courts, the Hawaii Judiciary Center, and the Hawaii State Bar Association's Civic Education Committee. On behalf of the members of those committees and the Planning Committee, we do again want to thank you for sharing your time with us today. 2020 has brought so many changes to the way we live and interact with one another. During this year, we've also collectively experienced the losses of many people, including those of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmed Aubrey. Through this five-part series, we hope to have in-depth conversations about local issues pertaining to race, data and criminal justice, civil rights and access to justice, unconscious bias, diversity, and empowerment. After the culmination of the five-part series, the Planning Committee plans to pinpoint actionable steps that can be taken to strengthen the system given the topics covered that we've discussed and work that has already started with many of our stakeholders in the community. We hope that all of you will continue to join us for each of these Friday sessions. Before we start today's discussion, it is my honor to introduce Hawaii Supreme Court Chief Justice Mark Ruchtenwald. I think you're muted. I thought I was, well, I got off to a slow start there. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Copeland. Good afternoon. Aloha, everyone. I really want to thank uh, the Committee on Equality and Access to the Courts, and in particular, uh, Judge Copeland, my colleague, Justice Sabrina McKenna, uh, Judge Sandra Sims, Willie Bagasol, and Dalen Heather for all their efforts in making this happen. Our Judiciary History Center, uh, the Hawaii State Bar Association Civic Education Committee, and the members of the Planning Committee who worked so hard uh, to organize this important, uh, important series. I wanna thank today's distinguished panel for getting us started uh, with this conversation about Black Lives Matter and the Hawaii experience. As uh, uh, Judge Copeland said, we have 500 people who have registered for today's event. And I think that's a testament to both the caliber of this panel and our collective need to confront issues of race and justice head on so as to create a more just society for all. Uh, today, on the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we are reminded that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Historically, throughout the United States and in Hawaii, barriers to justice have been built into systems, both knowingly and unknowingly, for generations. We cannot ignore that reality and the direct adverse impact that those barriers may have in our communities such as overrepresentation of Native Hawaiians, African Americans, and others in our prison systems. Like everyone in Hawaii and across the world over the summer, I watched the images of George Floyd's death with horror and dismay. For those of us who work in our justice system, which ascribes to the principle of equal justice for all, his death and the death of countless others has sparked a time of reckoning. The entire judiciary is committed to heeding the call to listen to the voices raised and to take action to confront the deeply rooted and systemic issues that challenge the fair administration of justice. In June of last year, I issued a public statement calling on the legal community to rededicate ourselves to eliminating bias and prejudice here in Hawaii and to continue ongoing efforts to address those systemic issues. Shortly thereafter, I joined my colleagues at the National Conference of Chief Justices to pass a resolution that calls on state courts across the nation to intensify efforts to combat racial prejudice within the justice system. While we in Hawaii are physically separated from the events on the continental United States, 
we are not immune to biases here in the islands, whether conscious or unconscious, unconscious, and have an obligation to examine ways to eliminate such biases from our systems and communities. However, efforts to combat bias and prejudice must not, must not end with just statements and words. Those with power in our institutions need to make concrete changes to truly improve the status quo. We must re-examine operation and processes through a critical lens and not shy away from sometimes difficult conversations about how we can work together to achieve a more equitable system of justice for all. This will take considerable work and will not happen overnight, but fortunately, much of this work has already begun at the judiciary and in our communities with governmental partners, stakeholders, and community members throughout the islands. We've seen this with efforts related to pretrial reform, initiatives to improve the response to those with mental illness, traffic fines and fees reform, initiatives to increase access to the courts and to support increased diversity in the legal profession, and much more. Thus, the conversations we are having today can build upon the efforts that have been started by many, and I appreciate the opportunity to rededicate the judiciary to this critical work. In sum, we are listening to those who have bravely raised their voices across our nation and in our islands to fight for a more equitable future. And we're committed to heeding the call to action. Thank you all for joining us in this effort. And mahalo to the organizers of today's event for creating a place for these conversations. Aloha and mahalo. Thank you so much again, Chief Justice Rechtenwald. One more thing before we start our panel, we would like to share with everyone a short video on the Hawaii Black Lives Matter movement. This video is created by the Just Future Project and features Nikia Taliaferro. The movement here in Hawaii, as many of you may know, held a rally at the Hawaii State Capitol. That rally was planned and organized exclusively by a group of local high school students, and their message is very powerful. Keahi, can you play the video, please? When we first decided to go through with planning this march in defense of Black Lives, we did an Instagram poll just trying to predict how many people would actually show up to the march so that we could plan things like water, plan extra signs. We had 500 people say yes, they would show up. When we first actually got to the event, there was the predicted 500 people. But when people started actually speaking in the beginning of our march, there was a much larger crowd. It was probably 5,000 people that had gone there. By the time we had actually completed the march, we had someone else come up to us and was like, there's 10,000 people here. It was so surreal. Hawaii for Black Lives was born out of planning that march. And I think the mission after the march is just to continue fighting for Black Lives within the Hawaiian Kingdom. One march does not solve racial injustice. Voting is something that is really important, but voting people into office will not solve racism. It will not solve any of these immediate issues that are happening in our country. I think that power comes from your community. You can build networks. You can have all of these other things without having electoral position. I think it's just about using your community to your advantage. Power is way more in the people than people that hold electoral positions, but you can't just stand by and hope that representatives just know that power lies within the people. It is something that has to be actively pushed. There is always a place for young people in this movement, specifically for events that will affect us when we are adults. Climate change is happening now. Racial injustice is happening now. Playing a role in your future now is probably the most important thing you could do. I think that what's changed for me since the march was a new sense of confidence, as well as realizing that youth voice specifically matter. Youth have not really had a seat at the table, specifically black female youth have not had a seat at the table. And I think that being able to go up in front of 10,000 people and have people be so supportive allowed me to realize that my voice does matter.
Thank you so much. That is just truly a powerful and important message from some of our Hawaii youth. It really gives us hope and it inspires the discussion that we will be having in this series and for the work that we have to do toward ensuring racial equity. With the video and the statement of Chief Justice Rechtenwald in mind, I'd like to introduce our first panel discussion entitled Black Lives Matter and the Hawaii Experience. We're honored to have the panelists here today, Dr. Akemi Glenn of the Popolo Project, Josie Howard of We Are Oceana, Kamale Maldonado of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, and Hawaii NAACP Youth Chair, Kristen Brown. The panel will be moderated by the Hawaii Judiciary Center's Project Specialist, Brianna Govea. Brianna? Mahalo Judge Copeland and Chief Justice Rechtenwald for your introductions. Um, and I wanna say mahalo as well to our panelists for sharing your mana'o today. Um, if our audience has any questions in response to the discussion, please send them in using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens and I'll pose them to our panelists at the end. Um, that video is such a powerful, powerful display and, and statement of solidarity uh, and community. So I'd like to ask this first question to Kristen. Um, you helped organize the group of student leaders who went on to coordinate the Hawaii for Black Lives March. What was it like to see your plans result in such huge collective action? It was beautiful. It was very empowering to see folks from all walks of life and from all around the island and to see youth come and use their voice and for good and for and for change and for things that they care about. It's, it was heartwarming and it made me feel hopeful. Things can change and things have to change. That's why we are marching. That's why we constantly use our voice and raise our voice and it's powerful. Um, it also made me think of why we're doing this. Like of all the things that we could be doing with our time during the time of COVID and things like, things like that, you know, we, us spending our time to come together as a community to be a part of something greater than ourselves, to march for something that we believe in. It was very empowering. And I hope that a lot of the other youth that probably either weren't able to attend or, you know, influence their friends, I hope they were able to take something away from that as well. Uh, overall, it was, it was very beautiful. Thank you, Kristen. Would you mind sharing more about your personal con connection to the Black Lives Matter movement? Of course. The reason I march, the reason I care, the reason I, I stand with BLM is because things can't stay the way they are. There's too much going on in the world, too much of negative energy that's going on in the world. And things can't happen, the injustices that we are still fighting for today that our grandparents and great grandparents have fought for. This, it shouldn't still continue to happen, but in this America and in the world that we are in today, we still have to fight just, just to breathe. And it's, it's something that ignites the fire and that still allows me to keep pushing and to keep pressing for, for better and to keep pushing for, for more because we deserve more. And also for the future generations, as our grandparents fought the fought we are still fighting the fight. So future generations don't have to. And that's why I fight. And that's why I march and peacefully protest and go to the Capitol and use my voice. So our future generations can live in equality and can live peacefully with everyone, not just have to constantly keep fighting is what I mean. And that's, that's why I march. And that's why I stand with Black Lives Matter. That's beautiful, Kristen, and thank you. Um, it's so exciting to see the youth that's involved in this movement as well. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Akemi, do you have anything you'd like to add, share us about um, your connection to BLM? Sure, um, like Kristen, you know, the, I see this connection to BLM as part of an ancestral connection and our birthright and our kuleana and responsibility to advocate for the humanity of all people. And a lot of activists have said this over the last year, certainly, and over many years that when we look at a society like the United States as it functions today, when we 
advocate for justice for those of us who are most marginalized and at the bottom of oppressive hierarchies, everyone benefits. Of course, we're also fighting for our very lives. And um, even though we're here in Hawaii, the connection to Black Lives Matter absolutely has resonance here in these islands because this is a place where we value human life and nature and natural life. Um, and we invest in uplifting the best of ourselves. And so even though we're, we're removed from some of the, the acute experiences of violence, um, we're still spiritually and intellectually connected to places and people who are enduring that. But um, just as Kristen says, we're also the inheritors of a long history of resistance to oppression and assertion of our humanity. And so Black Lives Matter is a very simple proposition that became a hashtag, that became a movement, became an organization that has had influence all around the world, not just in the US. Um, investing in that and being in solidarity with that movement um, is something that actually enriches all of us. Thank you, Akemi. Um, Josie, would you like to add anything? I think you're muted, there we go. Yes, um, I wanna first, um, you know, thank you for having this opportunity uh, to voice, you know, our stories and such an honor to be in the presence of other honorable speakers. Um, you know, when I think about uh, what the question and what the first person had um, mentioned, I think about my grandmother. When I think about racism and discrimination, I think about what my grandmother had told me. Um, I come from a different part of the world where I did not see um, discrimination and racism uh, until I came to America. And my grandmother brought me up with um, the advice or the wisdom of always treat others the way you wanna be treated. So um, that's um, what I wanna to add to this is that you know I see when I came here and started to experience that as a Micronesian in Hawaii, um, I always thought about that. And that's what fueled my, my fight for, for justice. Um, and when I learned about the Black Lives Matter movement, um, I know our experience is not any equal, but until Black Lives Matter, then it will also trickle to us. So that's that's why I'm here. Yeah. Thank you, Josie. Uh, I'd like to focus this next question on BLM and its connection to the experiences of Hawaii's Pacific Islander communities. I um, mean, with that, I'd like to ask Kamile to speak to how the issues addressed by the Black Lives Matter movement relate to the particular experiences of Native Hawaiians. Um, and if you can uh, speak about OHA's um, 2010 report that looks at Native Hawaiians and um, how they fare in our criminal justice system, that would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd love to contextualize this conversation and really ground the Black Lives Matter movement in Hawaii because it is alive and well in Hawaii. Um, even though Native Hawaiians and Black people have very different relationality to the birth and growth of the country, America, we, um, you know, we've had very different experiences at the hands of the colonial power of this country, but, you know, we know the same master. Um, ever since the first jails and prisons were built in our islands, they have been filled with Hawaiian bodies. And the earliest criminal code in Hawaii was a code of conduct aimed at assimilating and converting Native Hawaiians uh, to Western ideas of government and Western ideas of religion. And, um, you know, we have lots of large research, large scholarly work, um, you know, Radin Kiahiolalo writes a lot about Kamanava and his public execution um, and his four-year-old grandson Kalakaua forced to watch at gunpoint to be made uh, to be an example of and, and written about the carceral system in its earliest days in Hawaii, how it's always been used as a tool of colonization at the exact same time that the younger United States was engaging in ethnocide against its indigenous nations on the continent through policies of dispossession and forced assimilation. They were doing the exact same thing in Hawaii. So it should be no surprise when later in history we see the lynching of Joseph Kahahawai after being framed for the rape of Talia Massey um, and after a trial concluding in a hung jury. It's not a coincidence that he was the darkest of the five men who were framed for this crime. And it should be no surprise that his white murderers were convicted and their sentences commuted to a full hour of incarceration in a judge's office. And that wasn't that long ago. That was only in the 1930s at the same time that we, we 
we know the history of Jim Crow and, and public lynching of Black people in America was also very much alive. And we see up until today this police power being used to enforce the authority of the federal government and the state government over our ancestral lands, over our natural resources, and to suppress Hawaiian efforts to protect burials, sacred sites, anything that we still try to cling to um, as being Hawaiian. And so, you know, as much as we've tried to, we really have not escaped this past. Native Hawaiians know this very deeply because we still live this. Um, so yes, you mentioned the data. In 2010, we released a study at OHA, um, which a lot of people are familiar with. It detailed that essentially around 40% of our incarcerated population remain Native Hawaiian today, um, as compared to about 20% or under 20% of the adult uh, population in Hawaii. And uh, I think the most critical finding of that report was that when controlling for the offense class and all the other demographic and legal factors, we found that overrepresentation of Native Hawaiians accumulated at every stage. And we say that a lot, but that is huge. That means more Hawaiians were getting arrested, even more were getting convicted, even more were getting longer sentences, and even more were less likely to be paroled. So Native Hawaiians are being disproportionately punished for essentially the same crimes, and that is increasing at every level. Um, we do plan to update this study in 2020. We really don't expect to see anything too different. We've always been overrepresented. It's nothing new. It was by design, as I mentioned. And, um, you know, I want to bring back this discussion to um, the Black experience and this gender dimension of it as well. Native Hawaiian women are way more overrepresented than men, and this has an enormous impact in the Hawaiian community and on Hawaiian families all the time, 24-7. And as well, I want to also acknowledge community um, community movements. The the Civil Beat and other investigative journalists are really doing an excellent job of uncovering very opaque and even admittedly incomplete or erroneous police data. That even if just you just look at the data that's now being you know surfacing in the public eye, you can see that Black people and Hawaiian people. Um, and other Pacific Islanders as well are disproportionately the target of police force. So um, all that to say, even though our experiences differ very greatly throughout history, I personally feel great kinship with the BLM movement um, and responsibility toward the movement and, and gratitude for it too. I think we all have to have solidarity and I think Native Hawaiians feel that very, very deeply, like I said, because um, we know that our liberation is linked together. Thank you. Thank you, Kamale, for your mana'o and that seamless um, interpretation of history. It's, yeah, just the system is oh, such a disgrace. Um, but we have, you know, thanks to the work of OHA, bringing the data and the trends to light to share it with the public so we can really start moving forward. So thank you. Um, and Josie, uh, so does Hawaii's uh, Micronesian community, you mentioned earlier, um, definitely identifying with aspects of the BLM movement. So what can you say that um, with regards to perspectives or challenges raised by BLM that uh, the Micronesian community identifies with now and, and in what way are they identifying? Um, well, you know, like what I said about what my grandmother said, my perspective when I come out into the open world is to see people being nice to each other and to see people, other people, like you know like straight out uh flat out making comments that is just so not nice and so um violent um it's unbelievable for me because i was brought up in a culture uh that thought about taking care of each other and so that's why that i think that wisdom of my grandmother you treat others the way you want to be treated um i don't want to be treated like that and i i think when when I first went to school, what I realized was it wasn't so much the attitude of others toward me, but it was the system that was blocking me and barriers for me to advance myself. That was one. And then the other, and then when I moved uh, to Oahu after graduate school and I started seeing um, attitude toward us as Micronesians. So my early work was to really educate people about um, who we are and and that is okay if we wear the skirt and it's okay if we wear the dress, what's wrong with that? You know, to me, I think it's about the perspective. It's about what's right from what's wrong. And that is really foundation of goodness. And like Kristen, you know, when she started her speech, that's what I felt from her. It's that 
goodness in society that we all wanted. And when I see, uh, when I come here and I learn, well, even maybe before I came here, learning about the history of uh, the African-American or the black people in America, it just didn't make sense to me, like how could that be so? Um, and especially in a world that is supposedly uh, modernized democracy um, and for a foreign country, um, for a citizen of a foreign country that look up to uh, America, United States, it was just, yeah. So definitely our experience in Hawaii, especially the youth's experience for me, I always say that, I always advocate for them because I'm an adult and I can handle it. They can't handle it. And I seen how it had affected them. Uh, we have high rate of um, dropouts in high school. We have high rates of juvenile in the system. I mean, that speaks volume to our experience. So that's why I can relate very closely to that. Thank you, Josie. And thank you to your point about your own experience, feeling that system kind of bearing down on you. And um, I, this next question, um, Chief Justice Rechtenwald in the beginning quoted Martin Luther King Jr., his, his famous quote, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Progress does happen, but it's slow, it's gradual, often slower than we want. And it's because we're fighting against those systems, right, that have been ingrained since the foundation of America. Um, and so with that, thinking about how BLM issues play out in Hawaii, I wanted to ask uh, Akimi um, your opinion about where Hawaii falls on MLK Jr.'s uh, moral arc of the universe and what does progress look like? What, what will the future look like? Yeah, thanks for that question. You know, that, that quotation from Martin Luther King Jr., I think, um, circulates quite a lot because it gives us hope and it tells us that though things seem difficult right now, somewhere down the line, there will be justice that we'll reach. Um, personally, I think that there, there might be other ways for us to unpack that quotation. Um, one of the ideas that I think gets evoked when we talk about the bend of the the moral arc of the universe is that there's an idea of linearity, that it's linear. And I think um, what we see here in Hawaii and no less in the United States and around the world is that justice actually looks kind of more fractal. Things don't necessarily go in a single line. So as we've seen, um, there are huge leaps forward like getting um, voting rights and then there are huge leaps backwards and other things that pop up. So I would, I would try to make a little bit of a problem out of this idea of this linear moral arc that's, that's taking us towards justice and instead think of it as an exhortation for us to continue to fight and be vigilant for the ways that our freedoms and our humanity are eroded in different times. That said, um, you know, Hawaii is a really interesting place, especially in the context of um, American ideas of race and progress. Uh, there's some things about Hawaii that are light years and, and so such a far distance ahead of where the United States has ever been um, since it began its kind of project of colonial domination of the land and enslavement of people of African descent in particular. Those things didn't happen in the same way here in Hawaii. There was not enslavement, for example, here. And so um, we are already in a, in a better starting position in comparison to um, some of the things that Dr. King was talking about. At the same time, there is an American presence here and Euro-American ideas about race and the humanity of people um, certainly have shown up here. And as Kamile mentioned, just giving us that little snapshot, um, thinking about things like the aftermath of the Massey trial and how that was a clear indication of American ideas about race, about the phenotype of a perpetrator or someone exhibiting criminality in their very body. Um, those are things that we still have to reckon with here. And um, though they're different, they're still present and it's still worthwhile for us to unpack them. In terms of anti-Black racism, um, Hawaii is not exempt from this. This is a place where, um, you know, the, the colonial history of Hawaii, the experience of, um, you know, even American presence here was also bound up in the United States history of anti-Blackness, enslavement, dispossession of indigenous people. So of course we're gonna see, um, we're gonna see factors that are related that in our daily lives. Um, here in Hawaii in the 21st century, there's a violence against Black people. We mentioned uh, the Honolulu Police Department reporting about use of force. Um, we're overrepresented in those data for our small numbers. Um, there's also extrajudicial violence against Black people in our community. Um, in my position at the Popolo Project, we're a community organization. I get a lot of anecdotal 
information about people's experiences. Um, there was a black person who died in police custody on Maui uh, this summer. There was um, the um, still ongoing investigation in the, into the death of a black man named Julian Hayward also in the summer on Maui um, where he was found hanging on his front porch. And the initial response to his death was that it was a suicide. And for many of us who not only have grown up with the imagery of lynching, um, but also the intergenerational trauma of that, um, just that spectacle of his death was something that caused us to ask more questions. And as I understand that, that investigation is ongoing. But the fact that those things can happen in Hawaii, along with um, you know, the history and, and recent situations of workers being uh, racially harassed in places like uh, the Queen's Hospital and Hawaiian Airlines, we know that Hawaii is not exempt. And so I want to, as we think about the ways that Hawaii is far ahead of the United States in thinking about race and multiculturalism, um, we still have an ongoing occupation here uh, where Native Hawaiians are dispossessed. So I think that there's an opportunity for us to be sober about uh, the situation and see the things that we do well, but also continue to push and not just leave it to kind of the autopilot on the moral arc of, of the universe that takes us to justice, but be actively engaged in advocating for justice for all the people who live in this place. Thank you, Akemi. Um, Kristen, what are your ideas about the roles and obligations of civil society's leaders in raising the power of marginalized communities? Society's leaders have a huge responsibility when it comes to their communities and the people that elected them into office. That's, they were elected into office because they saw the people, their community saw potential in them and they saw what needed to happen in order for their community to succeed and to be prosperous and to, you know, come out better. And that is something that is not taken lightly and something that I don't want to be too frank or too blunt, but a lot of the communities, or a lot of the folks in power and in office around the nation at the moment, they're, they're trying to do better and under the circumstances that they're under, but I think still their communities are still suffering. And that's something that, you know, is, is also generational and is also something that is a work in progress. It will not happen overnight, as we know. But in order for the communities to succeed and for their and for their community electives to be prosperous, they have to actually go into the community and actually ask the questions and and interact with them. It's one thing to sit on your high horse, and it's another thing to actually get dirty and do the work and interact with the folks that you're the folks that elected you into office. And that's something that I am very passionate about. I very much feel there are not a lot of people that walk the walk and talk the talk, but they can, they can do one or the other. They can't, they can't do both at the same time. They're not good at multitasking, if I'm being very blunt. Um, and in, in listening to your community, that's how you grow, because how are you supposed to fix something you don't know is broken? It can make a, a raggedy sound all at once, but if you don't know, then then you're not going to fix it. You're just going to go go on ignorant to the to the problem. And in terms of uplifting marginalized communities, they have to sh shift their perspectives. A lot of community leaders in going into communities, you have to talk to everyone, not just those that are on the not just those that want to talk to you, there are some folks that they want to have the communication with their um, community leaders, but they might not be able to at the moment. Either you have to allow them to have different forms of communication because they're, they're working and they don't have time to take off or this, that, and the other. They have families and other, other things that come in the way. And so allowing different forms of back and forth communication and being able to be open, be very open-minded because I have the mindset of if, and a lot of my professors in, in college, they say like, if you have a question or a concern, there's a good chance a lot of folks do too. And so just being open and understanding and not taking each concern with a grain of salt, it's your community. If they care about it, then 
it means something to them. It means something to your community and you have to take that with you. Um, and so um, I wrote notes, so that's why I'm looking down. Um, and also when the folks of the community do come to make their concerns heard and their, their ideas and they voice it to you, take that to heart. They are taking time out of their day, space out of their lives and, and concern like a uh, brain space. They are taking a brain space to think about how to help their community and how to be prosperous. And so just, and also, and when you listen to it, think of a way to act on it. And if you don't know, then say you don't know. And there are more than people, there are more people that are willing to help and it's very powerful and just be open with your community. And I think that's something that will go a long way. And, and that's how we'll all be prosperous if we're open and if we're honest and if we are willing to have the hard conversations and find solutions to problems that we all see. Um, that's my response response to this question. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I, I want to touch back on Akemi's point about the non-linear uh, approach to thinking about the moral arc of the universe and that, you know, we're often seeing ourselves repeat history before we're reaching even just a little bit of progress. And like Akemi and Kristen both said, you need people to be active. You need your leaders to be active in helping inch progress forward. Um, and right now we're seeing communities around the world facing whole scale reckonings, again, uh, with racism and white supremacy. Uh, this weekend, we're coming up on the anniversary of the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom too, thinking about our own local history, uh, January 17th, 1893. Um, and I wanted to ask Akemi, what are the similarities or differences that you see between um, today's BLM movement and its sub-movements as well, Indigenous Lives Matter, to the US civil rights and Hawaii, Hawaiian Renaissance movements of the 60s and 70s? That's a great question. Uh, there are lots of similarities. We could probably have a whole hour just talking about these things. Um, thank you for reminding us about this weekend being the 128th anniversary of the overthrow of the government here. Um, and you, certainly last week, looking at the events at the Capitol, that was one of the first things that popped into my mind. Certainly one of the second things that popped into my mind was thinking about um, the history of seeing democratically elected governments overturned and people having their voice and their vote nullified in the United States. There's a long and deep history of that. Um, one of the episodes that popped into my mind looking at um, what was happening at the Capitol last week was um, the, the practice and the kind of investment in overturning democratically elected governments in the US South after the Civil War during the period, so-called reconstruction period. Um, one of the places that's actually close to my own um, family history is Wilmington, North Carolina, where in 1898, just a few years after the overthrow happened here, um, we had white supremacist insurgents uh, turn overturn a government that was duly elected by the community, a multiracial government, um, it's worth noting. Um, they ransacked the place and, and did a lot of damage, but also crippled the community so that they have not been able to really bounce back even in 2021. We're still seeing the effects of what happened in Wilmington in 1898, just as we're still seeing the effects here in Hawaii of what happened when the government was overthrown. So for me, the, the intertwining of those histories and the fact that people who were involved in white supremacist movements in the late 19th century were emboldened by seeing what has happened here in Hawaii um, were encouraged and, and backed it up. I think it's important for people to know that there were um, not just kind of casual white supremacists involved in the events around the overthrow, but people who are very committed to that, um, people who were involved in, in terrorist institutions like the Ku Klux Klan visited Hawaii to survey the damage after that time. So I think as we're kind of thinking about um, connections to this moment and things like the civil rights movement, we're really looking at a continuous struggle. There has never been a time since the advent of enslavement and expropriation of land from indigenous people that black people and other indigenous people have stopped fighting for our humanity, for control over our own bodies, for our own kin, for access to our lands. There's never been a moment, though we talk about these as different movements, the civil rights movement, BLM, um, thinking about things, protecting Mauna Kea, thinking about advocating for water 
and natural places. Um, there's never been a moment that we have stopped doing that. Um, I think sometimes these movements are useful for us to have a shorthand to refer to different moments in time, but just as my statement before about this not being a linear thing, um, it's also not been something that we've ever arrested from. So the similarities are there because I think the, the dangers and the threats to our livelihoods and our humanity are ongoing and consistent. They morph just as we and our resistance changes to adapt to the moment. Um, but I would, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people, I'm not a historian, but I think it's really important for us to learn about history and for us in Hawaii also to understand that some of the things that we're challenged by were prototyped other places. And I think to Kamile's point about incarceration, the incarceration system that snatches up Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders here was prototyped for many centuries in other places and once perfected was brought here. And I think it's really important for us as we imagine what a just future for Hawaii may be to understand where the real roots of the systems that oppress us um, are coming from. Mahalo, Kimmy, so many great points to keep in mind. Um, Kamaile, I'd like you to uh, follow up um, if you have anything to add. Yeah, um, I really appreciate the framing of this movement as an ancestral kuleana. That really resonates a lot with me. So I appreciate um, the way that Dr. Glenn framed it for us. I, I think Hawaiians are really used to thinking this way. Um, and I would encourage all of us to think this way because we know that this country was built on a racist system. And for all of our efforts to neutralize that over the years by tinkering around the edges of the law, uh, within just one generation's lifetime, pretty much, we've been able to convince ourselves that we fix the system, we absolve ourselves of any responsibility for its continued operation and its continued impact in people's lives. Um, but when we look around and we ask ourselves, do people of color still experience violence, disenfranchisement, dispossession, intergenerational trauma at the hands of the state? Obviously, the answer to that is yes. And if... Um, you know, if the BLM movement can teach us one thing, I hope that it teaches us to stop denying the lived experiences of other people and to really just try to listen and 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 hear really and appreciate and understand. So, so yes, we do experience these things. We talk about it all the time. And if it wasn't true, the data would not prove it out. We have, you know, this idea or this concept that Hawaii is this multicultural paradise and we're post-racial and we're so past all of that. Um, and we have, you know, a, a general accepted idea maybe among a lot of our uh, policymakers that uh, we don't really have a race problem and we hear them say as much all the time. And, and I just think that that kind of statement, that, that broad statement is just so damaging and it's so hurtful to the people who know deeply and personally that that is not true. Um, and so to deny that there's a racial dimension in community policing, police use of force, implicit bias in, in the interaction with legal systems, um, criminalization of poverty at the legislative levels is to participate in the erasure of these voices and the stories of our ancestors and of ourselves from the history of this place. It's to be complicit in the ongoing history of colonization that is still unfolding in Hawaii. We, our generation is the living generation. We are writing the current chapter and, and we can decide how honestly that this chapter is told and we can lay the foundation that will be uh, the system that our future generations will inherit. So we inherited the sins of our ancestors. We inherited the traumas of our ancestors. We inherited their struggle. Um, and we will decide if the next generation of African-American children, of you know, other Pacific Islanders children, of our keiki, our mo'opono will inherit the same system. And if they're destined for the same experience as us and our ancestors before us. So, you know, this is a hardship to turn and, and that's why these conversations are difficult and they're so important. Because when we think of it from an indigenous perspective, looking at the long view of history, the multi-generational view of history, it really is our kuleana as the living generation and our lives and the lives of our children and our grandchildren depend on it, uh, like Dr. Glenn said. Wow, um, what you and Akemi have just said is such a mic drop moment, so important. I'm so thankful for you guys sharing your mana'o and, and your energy and your time, as Kristen was uh, saying earlier. Um, we're moving on to our final our final questions before we get to the live Q&A. Um, I'd like to turn this one to Kristen. And of course, if anyone else wants to add anything, um, please uh, 
feel free to do so. But with with the pandemic and all of its all of its awfulness, all of its horror, um, it has allowed some of us, those fortunate enough, the, uh, a slower pace of life, time to kind of really think and sit with ourselves and think about our communities, learn, listen, change. Uh, so for this question, um, Kristen, would you mind break, breaking down what uh, anti-racist work really looks like, what it means to be an ally to the BLM movement here in Hawaii? Sure. Um, I want to start off by first, for anyone who doesn't know, it's pretty self-explanatory, but to be anti-racist is to uh, not think one skin color of one color is superior to another uh, human being, just pretty bluntly, simply. It's, it's that simple. That's the cool part. Um, and with that, you can, and also by having that mindset, don't like, Oh, I think Kristen's frozen. Oh no. Would anyone like to add anything while we have um, a minute? Hopefully she can, her connection gets better. It's America that we live in. Oh, there we go. Kristen, we lost you for a second. I apologize. I lost you. I'm so sorry. sorry. Would you mind <laughs> mind repeating what I'm sure you said so beautifully um, again for our audience? Sure. No worries. Um, Anti-racism is not believing that one skin color is superior to another human. Um, and, and, and to be an ally of the BLM movement is to understand and to acknowledge that at this moment, we are not equal. We are very much divided and and as Kamali said to not disregard one's experiences because of their because we live in Hawaii for example because we live here you cannot say that there is not racial injustice still here there is and you cannot dis discredit my my experience in saying that and also to do anti-racism work is to call people out very bluntly to call people out in a professional way and in a way that I wouldn't say damages their ego, but if that's what has to happen, that's what has to happen in a way that I uh, makes them see and allows them to realize their actions and that what they said or what they asked or the way that they spoke is not okay and that they need to change that because in this day and age, we are not gonna take being disrespected because of our skin color if you're if you're ignorant to something, it is our duty. It is our it is our kuleana to to educate you and to make sure that you move better and that and that you can teach those who are also ignorant in the future. It's not always going to be our duty to teach people, but for the time being, in order to progress, we all, we have to put our mindset aside and put our um, pride aside and help those that that are in need, and also in. BLM, Black Lives Matter, is not saying that other lives do not matter. It is saying that until Black Lives Matter, we like we are not equal. Until Black Lives Matter, all lives cannot matter. And that goes for all the suppressed minorities and all those that have to fight extra and, off, and have to do more just to make their voices heard. To do anti-racism work is to empower those and to give them a space, to give people of color a space at the table, especially if they're ready for it and if they, are, if, they have, if they have worked for it, to give them a space to be a part and to grow and to push themselves and then to uplift others as they are growing. Um, because there are so many and, and there are so many things that need to change and we are all not equal, especially now, especially what happened at the Capitol last week. I personally, as an 18 year old, I will be 19 on January 23rd. 
I was very frightened and very and very upset to see what happened at the Capitol. It's like, it's 2021. How are you this prideful and this arrogant and this uh, to, but what I would like to end with is that until Black Lives Matter, all of us cannot matter. And that is not to put down anyone or any thing it is a fact, it is a statement, and I stick with that statement. And to be anti-racist is to acknowledge that, especially today, is to acknowledge that. And it's not hard, but once you acknowledge it and you are no longer ignorant, you have to learn, you have to grow. And so, and there's so much more to be done and there's so much more action that needs to be taken and marching that needs to happen and peaceful protesting and talks with our legislature and talks with the people that are in charge to make change happen. That way we can all attempt to be equal, attempt to grow, attempt to live together in unity because right now we are so divided, it's crazy. It's like rain and sun. It is so crazy. It's like, well, we all know the opposites in the world, but that's what I would like to end this on. And we have to uplift those that want to be uplifted and that are trying and that are fighting. And that's what I would like to end with. Mahalo, Kristen. Um, yeah. Josie, do, yeah, please. Yeah, I think to align with the movement, just like Kristen said, uh, it, it needs to start with us. Each of us have biases. And that's something that, you know, uh, we all need to work on. Um, and if we can start with that, like a ripple effect, uh, then we can. And then the second thing is data. For me, for the Micronesian community, especially during COVID, uh, we were the most impacted. It was so important for us to disaggregate it data. Um, I feel like the lack of data on certain groups is a form of racism. And we need to work on that. So there is the part where we work on us as individuals. And then there's the systemic part that needs to uh, be corrected and it should start with data. Um, and just to end that, um, I wanna promote collaboration through diversity. It is so important to uh, honor the diversity within Hawaii and that the diversity brings the strength and um, their strength and make experience in Hawaii more colorful and meaningful um, based on the strength of each community that comes to be part of Hawaii. Thank you, Josie. That point about data is so, so great. And thank you for tying that in here at the end. Um, Kamile, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, is this a, a question about the forward thinking? Um, yes, yes. Any and any resources um, for allies? Yes. Uh, yes. So I wanted to bring back something that um, Dr. Glenn said earlier that about BLM kind of like transcending our experience. You know, it's really has inspired a global movement. We saw an enormous historic amount of outcry all over the world. People essentially seeing the same things in their government or seeing what was happening with ours and, and having you know so much to say about that and so much affiliation or kinship with that feeling and that experience. And it's also inspired and created a new dialogue um, and empowered indigenous people all over the world to stand against their colonial nation states to say native lives matter. And we've seen enormous movements in Aotearoa, Australia, Canada, Africa, and we can learn a lot from the international indigenous models of truth and reconciliation, which actually originated um, in South Africa. And so Hawaiian cultural peacemaking practices, ho'oponopono, 
all of it, it comes with a central idea, a very similar central idea. It's that reconciliation requires truth telling. And we in Hawaii are still very much in the truth telling phase. So, you know, I think we all are comfortable acknowledging our history. But like I said earlier, we have to think about it ancestrally, think about it as a kuleana for our generation. Um, and it's incumbent upon each and every one of us, Brianna, you, me, every person watching this, to think and do the deep work in themselves, to hold up a mirror to themselves and to say, um, you know, what, what is it? What, is there anything that I can do better? Is there anything that I can do more? Is there anything that I shouldn't be doing? To see racism in ourselves and in other people and to call it racism when we see it and to be fearless and tireless about that. And, and really to get off of our defensive positions and to just be willing to be self-critical and to engage in this dialogue with other people. And yes, Hawaiians, I am looking at you too, um, especially with regard to racism against the, you know, the other communities of Pacific Islanders that have recently immigrated to Hawaii. We have to be fearless about calling it racism when we see it. Otherwise, we are part of the problem and not part of the solution. We have to be willing to engage with our family, with our friends on an interpersonal level, because we are the best people who can get through to them. And we have to ask ourselves, how can I make a constructive contribution to this movement? Um, it's going to be different. The answer is going to be very different for every one of us, but we all have to explore our own privilege and our own positions of power and think about how we can use those to help foster an environment where truth can be told. And then we can only then, when truth is really told and universally heard and accepted, can we really move beyond that, moving beyond the dialogue to action, to policy, to change that our next generation, as Kristen is telling us, wants to see and uh, you know, toward meaningful justice toward all of, for all of us. Thank you, Kamile. Um, Akemi, your organization has put together a really great, uh, really informative um, packet of resources uh, called the Popolo Syllabus. Would you mind telling us a little bit about that? Sure, um, you can find the Popolo syllabus on our website, thepopoloproject.org. And it's a growing and kind of crowdsourced uh, resource for our community. Um, the focus of the Popolo syllabus is really to amass resources and information about Black experience here in Hawaii and across the Pacific. So um, certainly also even including the experiences of Indigenous people in the Western Pacific who are considered Black in so-called Melanesia. Um, we also are very interested in getting people to kind of engage with ideas about race. Um, a number of, of folks have said, you know, we refer to this, this mythology of Hawaii as a racial paradise. And I think um, just as Kamaile has mentioned, we need to have a, a, a clear reckoning about what we're dealing with, what has happened. We need to have the data as Josie has said. Um, and so some of those resources are available on our website, specifically focused on our black community. Um, here in Hawaii and across the Pacific. Um, we also, as an organization, engage in conversations and trainings and trying to orient individuals, agencies, and organizations to the history of race in Hawaii. And we do a course called Understanding uh, Race and Belonging in Hawaii um, that tries to kind of walk back. Um, I'm, a, I'm a researcher and data scientist myself, so I love to sit in the data and look at what's actually happening. Some of these um, pieces of data that we have need to be disaggregated. And, and when they are disaggregated, they start to tell a different story. Um, one of the things that comes up a lot is that there's a category of mixed race here in Hawaii, which anybody could be in. I could be in it. Um, the reality though, is that even though I'm a person of um, a diverse genealogy, I'm black and I'm racialized as a black person. And some of those details get lost as Josie said. So um, that course is something that we do and we offer to the community throughout the year. And um, we're happy to be part of other conversations specifically around the data disaggregation stuff. So I'd invite folks to check out our website if you're interested in some of those resources. Mahalo Akemi. Um, before we move to our live q and I just really wanna take the time to say thank you. Thank you so much for your panel, for the panelists. Thank you so much for sharing your energy and your time. This work is exhausting. Um, but it's important. Um, I'm very, very grateful and honored to be here to talk to you today. And thank you for all of our attendees. Um, uh, we had a lot of pre-submitted questions for the event. Many of them we've tried to incorporate into our uh, discussion already, but a handful 
that were a bit outside of the scope of this program have been saved and we will be integrating those into um, our next events, particularly our upcoming panel January 29th, which focuses on data and the criminal justice system. So we'll um, be expanding upon some of the themes we've talked about today. Uh, please continue to email um, your questions. But for now, let's turn to our audience questions. Um, I'm gonna look at some of the pre-submitted ones first and then I'll move to our Q&A chat box. So let's see. One question that's really pertinent to the issues we've spoken about today is, how would you suggest talking to my fellow Hawaiians and other Polynesians when it comes to the explicit distaste, dislike, and hostility directed at the peoples of Micronesia? So for anyone who would like to take that. Um, I'll just start and I'm just gonna repeat something that I just said, which is that you can call racism what it is. We can stop being afraid of using race, racism. I think we should all just get really comfortable with that idea um, so that it's it's not so hard to talk about it. The conversations are less uncomfortable if we just unmask what it is um, and, and allow ourselves to talk about that. And then I would encourage people to um, ask questions. Uh, why do you feel that way? I mean, or why do you think that's funny? Like what's funny about this? You know, is it, it and, and really kind of like encourage or force uh, the other person to acknowledge essentially what it is that they're saying and why they're saying it. Um, and I think, you know, again, this can be like very uncomfortable and it can be, feel very confrontational, but if you just get comfortable with the idea of talking about it, um, and I think a little bit too, have an ounce of patience um, and, and compassion for the people that are around you and are kind of just existing in this world and trying to move forward in it, but really just encouraging everyone to essentially take personal responsibility for every single thing that they say, everything that they think, every action that they make um, is, is a good start. Um, thank you so much, Kamaili. Um, It's just so wonderful that you started out and I can just follow up with, you know, just, you know, uh, one thing is that um, I had asked my question, the same question. I mean, I had asked that same question to myself. Why do they hate us? But one thing that I want to say is that our story, it's not any different from your story, uh, especially for Pacific Islanders. Um, I use culture to connect all of us, and I use our ocean to connect us. And, you know, I think Papa Mao did a really great job in an honorable way to give something that in our culture, it's only through family, because it's genealogy, knowledge is genealogy. So the, you know, the giving of uh, uh, helping the Hawaiians to resurrect their uh, navigational skills or knowledge. Um, but our, our story of colonization and our story of spamification where are held, you know, we're the most unhealthy in the Pacific. It's so, so the same. I, um, I did not learn that until I came to college and came to Hawaii that I learned, oh my gosh, it's happening to us in Micronesia, but it's just in a different way. You know, the nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands, um, the government system uh, uh, and changing everything. I mean, we have gone through four different colonial powers. And I know a lot of the Pacific Islands, other, uh, you know, Polynesian brothers and sisters have gone through that. So I think we need to connect um, on our similarities and on the fight for, uh, which aligns us with the Black Life uh, Matters movement, which is our colonization story. That's it. Thank you, Josie. You're welcome. Uh I have another question in regards to what occurred in the Capitol last week and continued growing violence and unrest. How should we move forward or protect ourselves? Um, I'm thinking people of color mentally and emotionally, especially since systems were never meant to protect black Hawaiian Pacific Islander peoples. Um, that's a big question. And I think, um, you know, I, I say this all the time, and I think it's important that we have ancestral um, examples of how people did this. Um, I think about my own ancestors who were uh, moved off of their land and trafficked and forced to work 
But one of the ways that they survived that and prepared themselves was by investing in community. And when we're caught up in systems that are not designed for us, um, we have the power on the ground, on the grassroots level and on the interpersonal level to build strength and to build power with each other. So I would encourage people who are um, bracing for what may come to make sure that they're connected to other people, people who share your, val who share your values, who understand what's, what you're going through, um, but also who can sit with you in spaces of love and sympathy um, as you have to be resilient for what's coming and what has happened to us in the past. Um, I don't think we can get anywhere without community ever and uh, no less when we're dealing with these really entrenched and um, adaptive systems of oppression that seem to find us in this moment, no less in moments past. Um, some questions that are coming up relate to thinking about the way our system of justice um, is organized and, and, and works. There's one question as noted in OHA's 2010 report, Native Hawaiians bear a disproportionate burden of the state's punitive response to drug use in particular. Um, please discuss the need to reorient public resources away from enforcement and towards non-punitive behavioral health interventions. And then another question came in asking, excuse me, another question came in asking if um, improving access to justice means more courthouses, more judges, more police. Um, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but I'll just start with responding that um, this kind of um, question about reallocating resources and kind of rethinking how we want to approach um, problems that plague our communities um, is, is not a new one. I mean, we have reports upon reports upon scholarship and years and really generations of information out there to support the idea, essential idea that uh, investing into communities and community-based interventions, community-based um, community oriented and not only community oriented, I mean community developed I ideas and, 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 and interventions that are directed toward aiding the community that are developed in the community are the best and most um, effective ways of kind of dealing with these things. So we are currently dealing with things in the most expensive way. And that's what we talk about all the time with the criminal justice system. Um, so I guess I have kind of like three main policy ideas, recommendations for um, people, uh, the, the powerful people in the room who are listening to this and, and want to think about directions that we can move in ways that we can change the system. And I am so excited and open to hear what the other uh, panelists have to say about this as well. But one, first and foremost for us, Native Hawaiians especially, um, I would like to see the state kind of start self-criticizing and, and thinking about ways that it can help to decolonize its approach to corrections to Native Hawaiians specifically and to support Native Hawaiian self-determination. That's really, um, at the end of the day, what Indigenous people want is the ability to, to be self-determining and, and to deal with our own people the way that we think is best. And so, you know, that is in, in probably in the judiciary sense, to look toward helping the Native Hawaiian community or maybe even taking hands off with the Native Hawaiian community to support the formation of culturally based um, alternatives to incarceration or to involvement in the criminal justice system altogether. Secondly, reforming police uh, but especially at least, you know, kind of in the initial phases, thinking about reforming um, community oversight and giving a genuine and real mechanism to provide oversight to all of our police um, in every county. And lastly, um, and one of my big, um, you know, pushes, and I think um, we have a few new legislators, freshman legislators who've been talking about sentencing reform. This is something that we've been talking about for years. Obviously, we have the report that's that, you know, focuses on um, the drug enforcement and the, the particularly punitive treatment toward Native Hawaiians um, with regard to specifically drug related offenses. But I, I think that, you know, that's, it's, it would be misguided to think that that's where uh, the work stops and, and that we could just, you know, defelonize this and kind of like restructure that. We need a top to down, uh, top to bottom 
sentence reform um, idea, because what we have right now is really absolutely not working. And we can see that report, report, report time and time again, every task force, every commission coming back and saying the same exact thing, which is that the whole system needs to change. And, um, and the piecemeal things that we've been doing in the past are not gonna, they're not gonna work. Thank you, Kamile. Does anyone have anything to add? Otherwise, I think I'll hand it over to Judge Copeland to give the final remarks. Maybe just a little bit. I think Kamile, yeah. uh, Kamile did a really good job in explaining that. And I just wanted to you know, bring it to a closing that, yeah, maybe it's time to start looking at uh, indigenous approaches that had worked. Uh, it's really important that we treat the person, but not the system. Um, because when we treat the person, that's when change happens. Um, and the system has to uh, be for the people. And if the system is not for the people because it doesn't accommodate the person's need, then there's a, you know, and a lot of our Pacific community, we still like Kamile had brought out the Ho'oponopono process. When I think about the insurrection at the Capitol, the only way to solve that today is to come together and truly have a, a real true apology to the different group. Um, if we criminalize, I mean, not criminalize, but when we criminalize that, uh, we're not fully solving the problem. It still stay on. Our Pacific way is a win-win situation where the person who did the wrong will, and the person who was the victim come together and they do the apology and uh, it's forever. And that's the system that you know works for us. So I think it's time to start looking at those kind of perspectives like uh, Kristen said, and start looking at other options, yeah, alternatives. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you again, everyone. I do wanna give just sincere thanks to the panelists and the moderator. This is such an important discussion and this panel is only the beginning of the communications and conversations that we will be having in order to work on this issue and really implement some actionable changes that you know, it's very clear that we need to do. Um, I want to especially thank Kristen for coming. Um, you know, hearing Kristen talk and Nikia in the video, I mean, it's just, it's very heartening and they are our future, our youth. And so I know it, you know, maybe it took a lot for you to come here, but I just wanna say thank you, especially to you for appearing today and being one of our panelists. I wanna thank Chief Justice Mark Rechtenwald for his leadership and vision without which this conversation wouldn't be happening. And Justice Sabrina McKenna, retired Judge Sandra Sims, both of whom are also on our planning committee and are working on these issues with us. All the members of the planning committee and everyone again who shared your time with us today, we do really appreciate it. I do want to remind you that the video that we watched earlier from J the Just Future Project is available on YouTube. If there's anyone you want to share that with, other youth um, that you feel might um, want to see that. And I'll just ask everyone if you would please join us for our other Friday sessions. Um, as Brianna indicated, our next session is going to be on Friday, January 29th from noon to one, and that is on data in the criminal justice system, an issue that came up today. So we'll be taking a more in-depth look at that issue at that panel discussion. And thank you everyone again for coming today. Mahalo everyone, take care, aloha. <laughs>